So tonight's event is called We Need to Talk. Be on the I just now. Let's talk small now. You know, tonight we have we're going to be discussing um a lot of different topics and from culture to umuwa, umuwoke, weddings, things like that. So tonight I'm going to introduce um our co-host, our guest for the night, the gentleman that will help facilitate this discussion. Um, so many of you are familiar with the uh what is a good word to use to describe this gentleman? Um the controversial um as coined as the godfather, Mr. Kevin Samuel, that had just recently passed, regardless of if you have um positive and loving feelings about him or you have some uh not so Christian-like views of Mr. Kevin Samuels. So he uh Mr. Kevin Samuels basically like brought to light what is known as the manosphere. It's been happening for a while, but when he came onto the scene, aha, he, he shook things up. And from there, you, we have seen different podcasts on YouTube um, and different social media platforms uh, where people are having their own podcasts. And ironically, I came across another po podcast where uh, the gentleman wasn't showing his face. He was just showing the people he was interviewing and asking them certain questions and really getting the conversation going and had them thinking. And the podcast is called We Need to Talk. And I was fortunate enough to be introduced by this gentleman. And uh, he is our brother. He, he He's the uh, host, the founder of We Need to Talk. Without uh, further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I introduce to you, Mr. O.B. They will know. How you guys doing? Doing good. Yeah. And be yeah, before you go, everyone, I'm going to let you know now. This is engagement. So it's not just you're here in your robe, your night's robe, just eating obono soup or gari. We'll be calling people out because this is a conversation that we're doing. So it's not just you hear our our lovely voice and that's it. So I'll pass it back to, to our guy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys. Thank you guys for having me. I'm super excited about this conversation. Um, shout out to Emeka. Uh, Emeka set this up. So yeah, we're going to have fun tonight. We're going to talk about relationships. We're going to talk about Igbo culture, Igbo history. And the goal of this conversation is to try to uh, marry, pun intended, um, how our culture intersects with our view on relationships, how our culture and our history intersects with our view of men, our view of women. So. Um, yeah, I'm excited. Um, a little background on me. I found that we need to talk in 2013 uh, when I was in college. Um, since then, um, we grew to about eight schools. Um, it shut down after COVID, so I took it to the online, the internets. And uh, since then, we've been interviewing people. Um, the series that you reference is called Kevin Samuel Started This Conversation. And the point of that particular series was to model the correct way for men and women to dialogue, right? So whenever you hear a male voice behind the camera, there's a woman sitting on the chair. When you hear a female voice behind the camera, there's a man on the chair. And the goal is to center the other person or other people during dialogue and listen more than we speak. Um, we also have a series called Christian by Default, where we explore uh, religion. Uh, there's another series called Listen to Black Men, where it focuses on the pathology of Black males in the United States. Um, we have another series called Black Marriage Masterclass, where I interview married couples and try to get some sense of why they work, right? Um, uh, people are different. People's circumstances are different. I'm trying to see if there's some common thread amongst people who are married and have been able to sustain marriage. So. Uh, yeah, make sure y'all check that out. Uh, we just hit, I think we're at 65,000 subscribers right now. Um, so, you know, we're moving small, small. Hey, that's all we can ask for. Yeah. So definitely check out his podcast. Um, it, it definitely challenges um, your thoughts and your perspective, which I, I really do appreciate. So, um, uh, yeah, so let's go ahead and get into it.
Okay. Let's do it. Let's do it. Floor now. All right. Perfect. So the way that I like to start, I like to do a poll. Um, what, what's the best way for us to do this or not? Should we do it in the chat or should we do, um, can they make something pop up on the screen? So I can, we can do the chat or the, um, I can okay. create a poll. So, um, actually, okay, let, let, let's, let's do a poll. Okay. Let's do a poll. I'm creating it. Uh, all right. So the question is, why do most people get married? Um, answer one is love. Answer two is status. And answer three is culture. I want to see how people vote. Love, status. And he said a culture. Hey. Right, culture. Yeah. All right. That's a tough one. That's the point. Oh, yeah. All right. So, how, ma how many people do we have in here? Uh, for now, we have uh, eight. For now, eight. Okay. Um, so, so we'll make it. We'll make it intimate. All right. Okay. So only three people. Chidera, you better have responded. You on your robe. Some interesting answers. Okay. Wow. And people, what do you think is because of love? Mm -hmm. Let me be quiet. Oh, this is getting interesting. I like this. Mm -hmm. And also, you guys feel free to turn on your cameras, turn on your microphones. I need engagement. Sorry, I keep forgetting I'm on mute. Yes, yeah, so we need some engagement, y'all. Don't be Come shy. On. Be don't shy. be shy. You don't need full makeup. This is a just this is a discussion. I'm gonna start on on, on muting people. <laughs> Chief, I'll... ah, God, I I'm so we have, um, Arthur asking these are these our only options, and I feel like we can talk about other. Options people, people. after the poll. Yes. No, I mean, yes. I think I think just uh, a jump start. Yeah, if these if these are the only options, if I just without going into other dimensions, I just say love. Because I think that's originally why most people do get married historically. But mm -hmm. uh, you know, the if I start trying to think why my sister's doing this or why I know this other person is getting married because of whatever, then and it might, you know, get a little more scattered. But I think generally speaking, we all want to get married because we fall in love with somebody, we care about somebody. And, you know, we want to make it exclusive. Arthur, let me see your face. <laughs> why? He said why. <laughs> all right, Arthur, let me let me throw a follow-up question at you. Um, how would you define love from an Igbo perspective? Mm. See, my, I don't know if I'm the best person to answer this question only because uh, I'm Igbo, right? By default, I wasn't, I didn't have a choice. I was born into this. But mm -hmm. if I define love as myself, as, as, as you know, a Nigerian American Igbo man, I mean, that's the question, right? How do I define love? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, love. Well, I mean, love. well it's, it's, it's a two part question. How do you define love? How do you think our culture defines love? Um, I think, I think I define love just, I mean, just those elementary feelings that you have for somebody, you know, constantly thinking about them, they're on your mind, you know, good or bad. So, you know, even when times aren't perfect, you still have a, a deep affinity towards them. Right. And so, you know, it might be doing the things that you have to do, even when you don't feel like it because you love someone. Right. Um, and culturally speaking, I don't know. It's, it's hard for me to say. I think I think that kind of sums it up, though, because a lot of our parents, if you need to look at our parents, look at uh, past generations, a lot of a lot of sacrifices were made, you know, for our, for our, our parents to come here to do what they've done so far to raise us. The sacrifices that we all know about. And one one sacrifice you make to one another is marriage. I think you know it's two people coming together saying, "Hey, let's be a little bit less selfish," and and uh, you know come together for 
not only this love we have for one another, but for the progress of, you know, starting legacy, you know, whether it's kids or, you know, even to, to build a house, a home, a career, things like that together. It takes, it takes uh, more than one person. I think we found if anybody's worked towards anything worthwhile, you know, it's just, uh, life's not easy. Life's not easy and it's better to do it with people you care about you know, build on something with the people you care about, see people that you love, you have something in common with. So, I mean, I think that's that's more related to the culture aspect of uh, of love. Absolutely. So, Tara, how would you answer that? Yeah, I was gonna say I wanted to answer that. <laughs> um, <laughs> how did you know, Alan? You read in my mind. I'm psychic. Like, I'm psychic. Creepy. <laughs> I'm just kidding. But um, I was gonna say, like, does it really have to be viewed? sacrifice couldn't it just be viewed as a choice because you know at the end of the day like you know it's two people you know making the choice after getting to know each other you're making the choice to do the next step naturally when you are you know getting to know each other you're getting romantically close more intimate you guys are friends you've gotten to know the person you can see yourselves you know creating a life together joining your two lives your two families like together so instead of viewing it as a sacrifice i would say it's more of a choice because I think, I think, yeah Sorry, go ahead you don't have to choose you could choose to walk away you could choose you know i really just don't think i'm ready or this is gonna work you know i choose you because i want to join my life with you i want to experience the ups and the downs because i'm connected to you i know you and I would like to continue to go through the next chapters of life with you. Yeah, I think I think to, to that, I don't know if I can respond to that as well. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, but I think, I mean, it's, uh, probably it's just a word choice, right? Like, I agree with what Tara is saying. It, it, is, it is a choice that we're making. But I just don't like to sugarcoat anything. And so it might come off uh, tasting bitter, you know? <laughs> but I think, uh, um, you know, bitter now sweet later but there there there's probably other synonyms that can be used for sacrifice so it doesn't sound so daunting but i mean truth be told that's that's what we do in love you know it's not all the time we make choices it is what it is it is what it is (laughs) so i think if i if i if i choose if i love you and I choose to say, okay, um, I want pizza tonight. And you, something that's simple, something, something very simple, right? It's not, not like a life threat where you're like, I choose, I, I wanted pizza tonight and you right. wanted tacos. And then I said, you know what? Um, let's, we're going to have tacos because I love you. I care about you. That wasn't like a I life compromise. sacrifice, compromise. but yeah, compromise is probably a better word. So there's mm-hmm. compromise that must be made. And I think, you know, yeah, I mean, this regularly you know, know what arthur you're right i take it back i think that there are certain things within the marriage that you can sacrifice you can sacrifice your independence and be more co interdependent maybe mm-hmm. you can sacrifice you know your single life you can sacrifice having more free time to yourself once the kids start coming in and once you guys move in together you're not going to be alone as much anymore so I guess when you think about it in that way you can say that you are sacrificing some things in order to be joined as one so maybe in that way I can say I could agree with that there are sacrifices you make willingly and hopefully gladly because you feel that it's worth more to be together and join your lives together than to just be alone. Yeah, I think I think at the root of it, like if on a far extreme side of things, we use the word sacrifice mm-hmm. and then moving closer to that soft, sweet space, it would be compromised. And then like even closer, further to that warm, fuzzy place. These are like just everyday choices that we make because, you know, I think, like I said, that if it, if it, if it weren't a major sacrifice, then what would be the point of marriage, right? We, you know what I mean? Like we could just be girlfriend, boyfriend, or we could just be besties all our whole life that just do, you know, shared agreements on things. So I think part of that is a daily act of like selflessness, you know, for, mm. for this common union. 
So, so and then, let me, and let me, me, I mean, I like, I like my things. I like, I like my respectfully, you know, <laughs> the things I like selfishly. I like them, so it would feel like a sacrifice. But you know, with the right person, you know, you're, you're willing to do it gladly. Yeah. Let me throw the question to a lady, um, either Ijoma, uh, Toya, Lavette, um, and Wendy. What is the Igbo paradigm of love? How do you think our parents, our grandparents would define uh, love? Don't all jump in at once. Oh yeah, Chi-Chi as well, I see you. Uh, Ijoma can't, she's uh, uh, at work, Working. but you can put in the call. chat. You can put in the chat. I'll go call. Okay, so she's saying um, it is transactional. Mm -hmm. Okay. Transactional, okay. Mm, that's, that's interesting. I was waiting for the devil's advocate about it. I was waiting for that. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? Um, It's not about If love, you want to talk to me, talk to, talk to me direct. Don't go through the corners. Oh, okay, so she also says it's not about love, more gender role fulfilling. Oh, okay. Oh, that's interesting. I didn't think about it that okay. way. Either. Well, let's see who who can actually talk. So I know Chi Chi and Ijama at uh, work. Yeah, if you can actually talk, so I can pick on you a little bit. Lovette can talk. Or wow. Yeah. <laughs> yes. I, I'm choosing welcome, violence. Welcome. That's wild. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Hello, um, good evening. So, uh, yes, I think I feel like I'm going to be saying something similar to what's already been said in the comments, because mm -hmm. like the first thing right when you said like, OK, from my parents, like what would they say like love is I, I was just like love I, like my parents would be like love love what like you know like love one thing to yes it's I think that for them it was more so thinking about okay what can my partner provide for me mm -hmm. you know um and if we're gonna make this work, okay, we want to have a family. So what can what do you bring to the table? What do I bring to the table? Okay, what can you do? What can I do? So um I do agree that it was it it did feel kind of transactional. It felt I I don't know. I mean, I believe that love was in there somewhere. It just wasn't mm -hmm. as pronounced as, you know, folk a more more of a focus on, okay, um, can are you can you financially take care of me or like take care of a family, uh, things like that. Do you think that's a result of our dowry system or do you think it's a result of kind of the situation of Nigeria? I do think it. it's, I kind of think it's a little of both because it's mm -hmm. like, okay, so our culture calls for that. Um, mm -hmm. With a and that's part of the reason why there's the dowry system is to see okay what 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 does their family what can their family provide like can you provide for my for for my daughter or like for my um for my husband or not husband sorry for my son things like that and um but I also think that it was it's because of the way that Nigeria is or was still is um. There's just, it, it really is, there was a more, there's a bigger focus on like survival than mm -hmm. really about this idea of like, okay, love. Because I don't know, like for my, I know that in, in our culture, love, yes, it, it can be there, but it's not, it's not gonna put food on the table. If right. that makes sense. Like at least, right. you know, it's all about the like materialistic, like, what what do you have that will actually help help me? Because I mean, love, well, yeah, we can have a lot of that. We can be rich in love and still be broke at the end of the day and still be like hungry. So it's like mm -hmm. also thinking about, okay, do I do we even have the resources? And that I think that's and and because of Nigeria's situation and everything like that, um, that's why there was a more emphasis on that than love. So I want to throw a question to um, anybody watching. How, how do you guys think the way that our parents 
in the way that our grandparents have established the paradigm of love has affected how we uh, date in 2023. Do you think there is any, uh, <laughs> you think there's any residue of how we seek out men or seek out women, particularly um, as Ebos? Come on now. If you want to talk to me, talk to me direct. Don't go through the corners. <laughs> I want to say something to that. That's hilarious. Yeah, I think, um, I think, at least in my experience, the the finger pointing shouldn't be so much as our parents or their generation or their, you know, their mm -hmm. parents. So I think, uh, I don't know, we, we do our own fair share of, of finger pointing within our own families. But I think it's, it's it's also important to really put it in perspective. If we if we're comparing things, you know, if we compare our own culture to other cultures, to other ethnicities and people, you know, you know, there's a reason why we have we're very proud of what we've done. You know, we've we've, been, we've accomplished a lot. You know, looking at you know uh, our parents just as as one example of people who. Um, made sacrifices, took really risky challenges to just up, 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 just leave their whole lives and go start something new. You can imagine doing something like that, something as bold and as daring as that. It's extremely scary, you know? And we should give ourselves more credit for that. Um, I know there's, there's, you know, maybe like little in internal family issues that we all have our complaints about, the things that we wish weren't as, as they were, you know? But I think more the, more the challenges that we, we face on ourselves is when we compare our our as as millennials or whatever comparing our lives to the other you know americans around us or whatever we see in this 2023 you know like this this modern day world i think if anything our parents got it right the best way they could from a traditional standpoint but the moment you know like we want we couldn't that our parents and their parents couldn't afford to share these types of thought-provoking, you know, top of Maslow's pyramid conversations. <laughs> like we, this is really, a, it truly is a luxury that we take for granted. And, you know, we do have a great sense of entitlement about it. Um, but it's like, we're, if we're constantly comparing ourselves to what's in, what's in the media today, um, I think that's what, where the, the problems right come up, right? Because now we're, we're exposed to seeing so many different variations. Yeah ever you know and it's like our parents didn't have all those things to look at and the the, the beautiful part of what marriage is worth being able to say okay we had one they had two they stuck it together they made it work you know <laughs> and it was, it was just that and and there's there's beauty in that so i think absolutely uh, absolutely tara what i see your hand up what what are your thoughts on this you're muted oh my gosh there i keep forgetting go. Yeah, I was actually going to read what's in the chat. So Wendy said, we don't know how to date. And Chidera mm -hmm. said, a lot of men are emotionally unavailable, for which um, Wendy also replied, some females too. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to throw this question at you. So um, uh, author is saying that we should be easier on our parents. We shouldn't be as hard on them or as critical. They did the best they could. Um, how critical should we be of Igbo culture in how we view love and relationship and subsequently marriage? Tara, that's you. I gotta be me. Let's let the audience answer that. I get ready for this. Come on. You okay. gotta lead by example and then we'll jump to somebody else. Uh, uh, okay. Sorry. Repeat the question again. I was not expecting so, that. A no, so, yeah. So, so how did our culture affect how we view love, relationships, and marriage? And okay. and how how critical should we be of our culture? Is the is the main question? Especially since like most of us are now Igbo Americans, it's it's going to be different. And you know we're from a different generation, and we have a lot more like freedom than our parents I guess in, in regards to this because a lot of like the females too are we're our own bosses we're successful we're not really depending too much on our husband's income I mean unless we want to um 
there's a lot of like entrepreneurs now and ways to just make money easily, even from being a content creator to uh, maybe an Instagram model or um, stocks. Like it's just, it's the world is just different now in regards to that. And there's just so much more freedom in our choices for that. So as far as like, Ebo being critical of it in regards to relationships. Um, it's all about, I think, success on both sides. Like women are looking for maybe not as much the financial aspect, but you know, we do see Ebo men being successful as, you know, that's my partner that's equal. Um, and that means that, you know, if the chips are down and I, you know, don't feel like working or want to be a stay-at-home mom or whatever the case may be, my husband got us. Um, I, I can't speak for, you know, all women in that regard. Um, I'm just kind of just, you know, you put me on the spot. So I'll just try to like, you know, throw it out there. Yeah. But it's just, I think it's just different. And the way that we are viewing marriage and our choices versus our parents, it's just going to be completely different because there's more freedom here too. Now, I also know that back home they're starting to kind of adopt the western mindset and culture as well but differently um so i think it's just different maybe but i don't know that's just me okay uh was that author who wanted to jump in yeah yeah i wanted to it kind of goes yeah. back to what i was saying earlier like they, they're really again like we're not gonna point we shouldn't point fingers at our parents to try to make sense of our own woes or dilemmas we shouldn't compare ourselves to other people to make sense or try to define what success is right like every every successful person is massively successful because they spend a great deal of time whether you saw it or not focusing on themselves and taking care of their own business not not comparing themselves and just staying in their own lane you know and then when you take a team or a partnership or a relationship whether you're white, black, green, or whatever you are, the most successful relationships are those who stay out of other people's business, mind their own business, stay in their own lanes, build with each other. You know, all this comparison and like finger pointing and stuff like that's that's where the problems come up. When you're in when you're when you're in your own bit of isolation, right? And you're on your own your own bubble, then it's like, okay, you really find out between you and God what's the real. You know, and that's what that's where the, the sanctity of marriage comes in, because it's like, OK, now I have this one person, I have this one partner that I'm sharing this with. And we both are now 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 it's not so lonely. Right. This road I take. So now I have my partner who we can kind of just like tune everything out and just focus on us. And that's 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 the beauty. And that's, just, you know, in the moment you start like comparing to this person or that person or saying, oh, the problem resides because of this individual that parent or whatever that's when the problems come so i think it's important to just like you know like evil somebody talking about dating like dating in it in and of itself is funny because i was having a conversation with a friend the other day it's like it's kind of a weird experience if you think about it from a social aspect i mean we know it's a normal thing to, to date but like it becomes ever more weirder or like uncomfortable the moment we start like you know getting outside of ourselves to compare about whatever else is going on like if there's enough anxiety alone to meet another stranger to find somebody i'm kind of interested in and see you know what's going on so i'm actually i'm, I'm gonna push back a little bit out there if you don't mind yeah sure you know so i'm a i'm a documentary filmmaker so being critical is kind of my job um i'm working on a film called um the bite of biafra and I want to kind of touch on the Biafran war. I want to touch on Igbo culture and also kind of build that uh, historical bridge between Igbos and African-Americans. And one of the things that I found is that we haven't been critical enough of ourselves. I think we could stand to be a bit more critical, productively critical. Um, but for the vast majority of Igbos, in my case, in the case of some of my family, some of my friends, um, we have a lot of uh, skeletons in our closet that we, you know, brush up under the rug. A lot of things that we've done in our culture, in our families that lead to very, very bad outcomes down the line. And, you know, 
because we're not a culture that celebrates introspection or celebrates therapy, for instance, a lot of these problems just compound, right? So if we leave our culture kind of free of critique for, for fear of, um, you know, blemishing it, how do we grow? How do we um, expand ourselves as individuals and as a culture? That's for you. Yeah, no, that's, that's, I totally get that. And I totally understand that. Like, you know, like you said, uh, I think the words you used was progressive. Uh, what was the words? There's, there's introspection, right? But we want to be progressive, mm -hmm. right? Because progress does require uh, a great deal of introspection and also understanding that, you know, to create something new, right? You have to be that thing, right? It's best to lead by example, right? And in order to lead by example, you, there's, multiple you know it's not one dimensional so i think you know when it comes to when when you're in practice of doing it just like you know as you're working on your documentary i'm sure you'll be able to understand like the different nuances of creation of creating something new what it requires to collaborate when it when it requires to like be more extroverted or to be more introverted in order to right build something that's significant that last um you know i don't i don't want to take complete blame off of our parents, for example, for, for their, um, their, their maybe intentional blindness to their own faults, for example, that have, have, have had an effect. I don't want to make it seem like they're just like saint, saintly and perfect and all that. No, by all means, no. But um, I know that each generation that comes, whether it's our great grandparents or great to grand to parents to us, there's going to be a deal, uh, a, a significant amount, even when we parent our own children, where we won't always get things quote unquote right. We won't always be quote unquote perfect. We'll always be in an, an ever, ever growing stage of doing our best. And so like our parents, we, we can be the joy for our parents, just like they were for their parents by being able to lead by example, right? To be like, to have the freedom to have these conversations is one thing but there's also another thing from being introspective to being more act action oriented using that introspection and then applying it right mm. so um we do you know, when it comes to mental health mental awareness and things like that we're now looking at it we're now addressing it we're actually making it a thing that's a topic of conversation which is important and i think it's important to understand that okay we can have the conversations all day that that may may or may not be triggering in many ways right but we need to know that you know the we still move forward you know right. we still move forward and, and we we do that by having a sense of autonomy and a sense of like independence of whatever else the world can throw at us because we're just we're never going to be fall short of opportunities to say hey you didn't do it just good enough or you didn't do it just you know perfectly right I don't okay, know if that's Arthur, I hear you. I hear you. Uh, I agree with you too. Um, and I just wanted to just like cut in to also kind of um, also just hear from uh, Kalechi. Did you want to say something? Well, yeah, I, had, I wanted to say something. And then I also got the request to, you know, to unmute. We kind of coincided. So I guess. <laughs> Yeah, but anyway, when it comes to the, of course, the issue of marriage is always definitely interesting, you know, whatever the generation. Um, what I would, you know, like to highlight is when it comes to those of our parents or, you know, older, earlier generations than us and compared to, to the current generation, of course, there's going to be, there, there are going to be differences. Uh, there's going to be pros and cons to each side of it. So. And you know, when we consider it at the end of the day, these pluses and minuses at, at both sides, it, it raises the question. I, I, I have the question, can we really say that we're better now in marriage, in handling marriages than our fathers were? You know, because you know, the thought, the thought about, oh, let's crit let's critique the older generation. You know, it's 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 almost as if to say, yeah, we're it's better now. So what did they do wrong? You know, you know, or, or what can we correct from what how our parents handled marriage you know, take for example uh the way it's there is more 
there's more individuality, more on your own, you know, like now your own in the current, you know, uh, let's say Western uh, civilization. But back in our parents' times, there was more of a, it's more of a communal thing. You know, talk about uh, therapy, for example. You say, okay, these days we have therapy in your know, sessions and so on. And so, on. but but back in uh, in their time, they do things communally. You know, like they have meetings. You know, equilibre is what you know they call it. Equilibre, like you you go for family meetings. You know, your 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 concern is their concern. You know, so if you have that kind of you know the tra traditional wedding, your weddings is the is your is your family's business. You know, so when you have those kind of community interactions. Do you really need therapy? So should we say that they made a mistake in not doing therapy when we don't have, or we, we don't have the kind of communal togetherness they have they had back then? So to me, it's like, yes, we are not perfect. You know, like the, the rate of at which we're breaking down marriages, are we not beating them? So are we really better than them? So yes, they are not perfect. Neither are we. So it's like, okay, let's pick up and see how we can move forward, especially in the area of marriage. And yes, take what, what are the positives from, from them, uh, leave what are the ne negatives, but also understanding that in our present generation, we have our negatives. What is, for example, this modern, uh, you talk about uh, what, what is it that makes a marriage crumble or get challenged? One big thing would be, first of all, how many thousands of Distractive options or distracting options do you have? Hundreds or thousands do you have? Oh, Mkechi, oh, wow, yeah, wow. See your man, oh, wow, see a maker, wow, but see you being there on Facebook, but see Chidema on, uh, on Twitter. But, you know, so, oh, look at Chidema's house. Look at it, you know, you have all these, there's so many more ways to be distracted in our generation, you know, where, whereas they had more ways to be focused over there. So to me, I'm like, look, you know, Pick what 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 you can what good you can you know take from wherever and, and move forward. When it comes to the area of marriage, yes, they had their pluses, they had their minuses. We have our pluses, we have our minuses. So, you know, yeah, I won't. To me, the the critiquing won't be a big thing. I I, I don't want to be the kind of person who be like, yes, it's because my parents they they didn't use the word love. You know, I love you. They hardly said that word, I love you. You know, so that is what is affecting me in my dating today. Uh. They may not have used the word I love you, but we have the word ihunanya, but we don't really use I love you. But that love is, Chidima, have you checked your car? Is your oil working? You know, have you, you know, that's your father's love for you. You know, today we may say, I love you, I love you, I love you, but fathers will still kill their, their children. Mothers will still, you know, kill their children, will still kill their, their, you know, but we don't, we hardly have any of that stuff here, there. So at the end of the day, it's, to me, it's like, I'll just round up and say, it, they had their positives, they had their negatives when it comes to marriage. Mm -hmm. We have our positives, we have, we have our negatives. And I yeah. personally can't even confidently say we are better in our current times in marriage. So let's go ahead and critique the, I, I can't confidently say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that perfectly leads to my next question. Um, one of the things that uh, I talk about often, even with African-Americans is, I think our generation is looking for different metrics to, to, to gauge success, right? Our parents' generation, um, you know, uh, baby boomers, gen, gen X, they looked at a successful marriage as a long marriage. A lot of us grew up with parents who had been together forever, but it wasn't a good marriage. And, and it set the kind of precedent in, in, in us to say, if, if it's not good, especially with all the options we have. If it's not good, I don't want it. So, you know, as the youth, what metrics do you guys think we're gonna use to grade a quote unquote good marriage uh, in the next 10, 20 years? And I want, a, I want a woman to jump in there. So Brandy, Toya, Lavette, Anike, each on my left. Marlene, oh no, nah, go yeah. okay, well, I know you have speak. things to say. Anike, and speak next, you know. I start choosing violence with my 10,000 names. Um, <laughs> you got 10,000 names. You actually have uh, names. It's hard to keep But I think name. in relation to what um, Helichi was saying, I think that was his name. I think he mentioned something about how there's so many options these days. And I think, yes, in some ways that is true, but I also think there is a change coming where, especially within like 
black couples you see I feel like you see more black couples staying together longer these days than you did maybe a couple of years ago where for me I didn't really see I don't really observe that many couples um that were together but I think even going back to our fam like parents age days there were less options there were less things to distract people like was mentioned earlier and I think for them they that did make them stay together longer um what do I think in terms of what people are going to be looking for long term? I don't, I don't, I don't know. I think it depends on the person. I think everyone is different. Everyone will have different views on what will make their relationships last. Um, I think a lot of people these days look at the wrong characteristics. I think people look at things like how much money do you make? How tall are you? Like, is that going to help you raise your child? Not really, no. Um, that's just my viewpoint. Brandy? No, Brandy got something to say. Brandy? But, oh, okay. Oh. Can you hear me? Go ahead. Yeah. Well, I don't have much to say today. I'm just observing, so. <laughs> Nothing okay. at this time, but I'll let you know. Thank you. Sounds good. Sounds good. I, I, I have another question for Nikkei. Um, you said we're using the incorrect metrics to date and and subsequently kind of evaluate our ability to date what do you think are the correct metrics if we're using the wrong ones what are the right ones um again it depends on the person and their values and what they think is important for their future family um but i think too many people these days are looking at changeable characteristics so you're looking at things like what car do you drive like they might lose that car in the next how many years? Are they, is, is that gonna help you with your family? No, not really. Like too many people are looking at things that are changeable instead of looking at things that are stable. If you look at your stable characteristics, how does the person treat you? What are their values? What do they want out of their future family? Are they willing to have kids? Are they willing to help you raise those kids? Or are they gonna sit down and expect you to do everything? Things like that are going to help you to know what kind of man or woman Am I going to marry? What is my future life going to look like with them? I mean, I see people these days, I know a, a woman that's married, her husband's in the house. He comes back home from work, he goes to his room, she's left with two kids. Might as well be a single parent. Like, what's the point? But when you were getting married, you were looking at, oh, he travels. Oh, he's tall. Okay, but now you're married and he's got, what's he doing now? Like, so for me, it's, you have to look at certain things and think about the future and what's that going to look like. Yeah, it, to to kind of add to that, um, recently there was a young lady that we was having conversations, and uh, one thing she said I've been hearing a lot lately is like I broke up with my ex because he wasn't my person. I'm like, your person? Which one is your person? I, I, I really don't understand what women mean when they say person, because I only hear that from women. Now, at the same time, I don't date men, so maybe men say, I don't know. But I'm like, what is your person? You know, you hear, I hear my person, compat compatibility. I'm like, if, if you don't want to date yourself, then you're going to date somebody who is quote unquote not compatible. And that's, I, I think to me, that's the point of relationship. You have two strangers who are working to try to become one, quote unquote. And, you know, you might, you will butt heads occasionally because you're still used to your individual self and, but you're trying to adapt to bring this person into your life and you two are strangers and trying to be whatever. So it's, it's, a, yeah, it's an interesting dating article somehow. <laughs> so, do you guys do you guys feel like um, trying to find a Nigerian, uh, an Igbo man or woman, is more or less difficult than trying to find, you know, maybe an African American or, you know, Oibo? Big time. I said Oibo. He chose violence. <laughs> oh man! Jump I in don't... there. <laughs> what, when, yeah, when you... everyone's saying yes. Honestly, like our expectations, I don't know what it is, but we just have some high expectations sometimes, I think. Like, 
there's just so much like emphasis and uh, I don't know. I just feel like, yeah. Oh, Wendy's saying not hard in Atlanta. <laughs> what do you mean? Wendy, you got to explain that. What does that mean? Not hard in Atlanta? What you talking about? Okay, y'all, I'm at the gym. That's why I haven't been talking as much. But I feel like it's not hard to find Africans in Atlanta, so. She do got a point. There's no shortage. Yeah. I feel like if we lived in a different state, then yeah, it would be harder to find, especially Evo people, but we have a good community in Atlanta, so we have a lot to choose from. But in terms of like, obviously it's easier to find an African-American guy, but I feel like most of them are not as serious as Evo men, but that's my opinion. Ooh, Jama says the quality. It, wait, what do you mean by quality, Jama? Quality. Yeah, for me, I, that was going to be my question. Like, it, does does abundance necessarily translate to quality? Because I hear a lot of people, especially you know, people who live in Atlanta, they say that we're all over the place. But mm. you know, this one is doing Ron's girl. This one is doing uh, four one nine. This one, you know what I mean? So, like, does does the fact that a lot more people are available, whether we're talking about Atlanta, DC, Houston, translate to easier to to find somebody that you're looking for? Yeah. And then the whole moving to like a different state to find your spouse is a thing right. now. It's all over right. like Instagram. I'm saying move to Texas. If you're in Atlanta, move to Texas, like Houston, Dallas, they got guys or mm. go to tri-state. If you're in Atlanta, you're going to find a guy there or go to yeah. the DMV. You know, you're going to find a guy in a different state or vice versa. Like everyone's just like moving to different states because the state they're within, they can't find anybody apparently. So that's like a trend on Instagram. And Wendy's, Is it working? Well, abundance makes it easier is what Wendy said. And then Ijoma said, no two different things. Sense sometimes no day. Respect is out the window. Direction of life is untraceable, just to name a few. Chisholm has the hand raised. Go ahead. Speak to us. Please. You know, I don't know if it was a Bible verse or just a wise man that said that change starts within, not with moving to Atlanta. And and that's really speaking to me right now, because um, no, in, in all honesty, we're talking about, you know, abundance and compatibility and all these things. And, you know, maybe I'm a little biased, but I do feel like, you know, I, I do feel, especially for my Igbo sisters in Atlanta, trying to find, you know, a good Nigerian or Igbo man, because, you know, there, there's, there's good Igbo men, that, but especially, you know, before 25 or 30, you know, they, uh, many of them, us, them want to, you know, or struggle to like settle down and just pick one and be with one and commit to one. But, you know, um, I don't know if, if that's like more of a cultural thing, like being over here or, you know, just a decision that has become like enculturated from back home. But I, what mm -hmm. I do know is that at some point, you know, there is a shift where when men become more serious or thinking about marriage as they get older, then, you know, it's almost like, it's almost like as women get older, there's a point where it's like they're more and more and more focused on marriage. And after a certain age, I don't know what the age that is, but they, they shift more to a, set, a mindset of, oh, well, if you know, if it happens, I'd love for it to happen. But if it's going to happen, it has to be with the right person or under the right circumstance. Cause I've dealt with so much nonsense in my younger days that I don't even have the patience for this anymore. And so, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, not, it's, it's not really a simple thing. And there's, you know, we, once we start going into generational stuff and, and um, you know, it, I can make a whole nother talk about that anyway long story short i do not think it's as easy as people you know talk about it being just because you meet nice people doesn't mean that you're compatible and compatibility right. can be a lot of things so yeah right let me let me uh throw a follow-up question as a as a nigerian Igbo man what are some challenges that you have seen heard of you know discussed with your boys with dating nigeria Igbo women uh, okay, so I'll, I mean, I'll give one just that, you know, if you're okay. dating an Igbo woman, it's like, there's almost this pressure of like, 
okay, this has to work, you know, like mm. from the jump, it's like, not just like, a, okay, we're gonna, you know, get to know each other and date and, and see if, you know, we're compatible. It's like, yo, I'm Ebo, you're Ebo. Let's go ahead and do the aquaca and, you know, you'll bring the wine to my father's house. I mean, it's not like that, but there's, oh, there's, <laughs> oh, there's like, clapping. <laughs> there, there is like this underlying yeah. pressure that's like, you know, we're from the same culture, so there's, like, right. conversations we don't have to have. So it's almost like, okay, if this doesn't work, is there something wrong with you? Is there something wrong mm. with me? Like, it's no, it's not, there's not that, like, I don't want to say natural progression, but there's, like, an added pressure from being from the same culture because we're here. So mm. that's that's the biggest challenge I've seen. All right, Arthur, jump in there, man. <laughs> okay. Um, I think you guys said a, a whole lot of good stuff, man. And um, I think for me, the it's, it's challenging hard enough as it is. I'm 38. So to find, even if I don't say just Igbo women, if I just say just like Black women, right? Or someone who I find compatible. I think it's hard enough, right? Um, but then when I look at Igbo women, then I think that's another subcategory. It means the, num the number of in population comparison to all black women um, is smaller, right? So then it'll be doubly more challenging, right? And usually our Igbo women or Nigerian women at their high standard, meaning they the rightfully so, they've earned it. Most of them are all, um, you know, agreed from a, from a corporate standpoint, economically, they're, do, they're doing well for themselves, they're intelligent, they were raised well. And so they're top of their class. So, so that's, and, and then I forget who just, I think it was Chisholm that just spoke, but it was like <laughs> that, that kind of pressure to be like, uh, it's like almost like a scarcity mindset. It's like, okay, well, this is about as close as it's going to get. So let's, let's, let's jump the room now, you know, like that, that is pressure. Right. But I, I, my thing is, I think uh, that finding someone who has that emotional intel intelligence, uh, emotional maturity has been the biggest challenge I've found um, because, you know, these days, I don't know if someone said something similar to it, but it's less, a lot of transactional interactions happening. Mm. And I think the advantage we have now is that, you know, with technology and everything in this, in this day and age, we can like, you, you don't even have to have a college degree to come up and become wealthy or to have a plan for your family. And like the logistics of that, like sincerely speaking, are way, way more simpler to construct and it's just a matter of just putting one step in front of the other. So, but I think the more complicated thing is having someone who's like developing themselves communicatively, you know, like that's something that yeah. you can't. So one of the women's women said, talked about raising children and how will you interact with each other and all these things like that's, that's so paramount, you know, mm -hmm. even if we were racing and, you know, buying houses and making money, like if we yeah. did all of that, like how, how will we keep it and build wealth and like, leave legacies and stuff like that. We didn't, we didn't know how to communicate with each other intimately and things like that without stepping on each other's toes. So like for me, searching in the pool, like I'd much rather be around our UIU clans because it's just like, okay, that that enhances my, the population, our odds, but it's still that, you know, discerning of, okay, does this person have like emotional maturity or are they, are they just thinking transactionally? You know, that's the challenge I find. Yeah. Definitely, definitely. So before we move on to the ladies, because I'll give you guys a chance to complain. What is um, or what would any of you guys say to explain some of men's grievances, some of Igbo men's grievances, like the pressure that we're talking about or the, uh, the transactional energy that some Igbo women approach relationships with? I'm going to start calling names. Ijoma. Christina, somebody, Wendy, Marlene. Ah, uh, you people. Are All right, Marlene. There we go. Talk to me. <laughs> I'm driving, so if I like lose you all or you can't hear me, mm -hmm. just let me know. Um, sure. But yeah, so a lot of interesting things has been said, but you know, I feel like when men say pressure, it's almost like some something that's worth a hundred dollars, you want to get it for like fifty. Like, if mm -hmm. you want something great, why would you, even though there's pressure, you know that you're going, you're getting an amazing thing. So I know for me, I'm 35, 
single, so it's definitely be hard out here, but I had to realize like not to compromise. Um, and from a biblical standpoint, because from a biblical standpoint, I was like, you know, if he's nice and he loves God, then essentially everything else will come into line. But, you know, like the person said previously, how they communicate, those things are not necessarily like going to be scripture wise. Yeah, there's scripture that talks about that, but you're not going to find a Christian that can communicate, communicate well, that's not just going to go together. So I had to like, look at other things and say, you know what, I'm not going to compromise just because he loves God and he's seeking God. Um, there was things that I was like, no, if, if I'm worth this much um, for God to say, I feel pressure and that for that to deter him, it's, it's, it's kind of like a turnoff. Like, you know, you want something special, um, even though they're like, you know, the ratio would have last time, like 20 to one, I don't put myself among that. Like, I feel like I'm very much set apart with what I bring to the table. And because, you know, I seek the face of God, I feel like that's a big thing missing from relationships. Um, so if you, you're going to feel pressure with me and I'm going to feel pressure for you, you know, you're that guy, right? Because I know that you set apart and you're worth um, a lot more than what the pool is. You're set apart. So um, yeah, that's kind of interesting that guys do say that, but I essentially that shouldn't deter you. You know, what? one of the things that, you know, I noticed um, as an Igbo man also, I've, I've attempted to date Igbo women a couple of times. And there was a, and, and to be fair, I've seen this in my sisters as well. There's almost this arrogance. There's this air of pomposeness or pomposity. I don't know which is the correct term. Um, how would you guys explain that to us or help us make sense of it? Because I grew up seeing that in like aunties who would pretend they didn't see you until you started, or like you greeted them. So how would you, <laughs> how would you explain it to us who are trying to um, approach relationships in good faith, but are met with some of that resistance of you got to prove yourself to me? but you have to assume that I'm inherently valuable because I'm a woman. Is that question for Lovett. a woman or in general? Yes, Lavette, Lavette, she's got a hand up. Talk to Hello. me. Yes, um, and I think, well, it was already said in the comments, but I do feel like that's already us, just Ebos across the board, like mm -hmm. women and even just Nigerians in general, like we do walk around with this air of confidence that, is just inherent in our people, in our culture. I don't know if it's, um, I don't know, like, because you'll hear other people, you'll hear other groups of people say that, like Americans, mm -hmm. like they all say, yeah, Nigerians, y'all walk around different, you know, like it's just, and so I do feel like with that, it's coming from both sides. Like it's not just mm -hmm. men feeling that from women, but women are also feeling that from men. And I, I think that um, with that, maybe there is a little bit of a, a disconnect because then that means that like, maybe we are kind of like each other's, like we're, we're now like kind of pushing each other away type of thing. So absolutely. No, that's, that's kind of how absolutely. I feel. You know, I mean, to be fair, I, um, I agree with you. I think, you know, it is in, in Igbo men and Igbo women. And it's, it's one of the things that I'm critical of because I don't think it's doing us any favors. And I actually don't think it's confidence. I think it's like a pseudo confidence. And part of it was put into us by our parents. You know, a lot of our parents, um, especially the ones who weren't necessarily rich, they, they had to, um, I don't know if you guys are born in Nigeria, but we'll call it forming. They had to form. They had to look the part, right? And, and sometimes we prioritize looking the part as opposed to being the part. Like I know some doctors who are miserable, they hate their jobs, but outside they pretend like, yeah, I'm, I'm the best things to slice bread because our culture forces us to prioritize optics over actual like, you know, self-actualization. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's confidence when I see it in the men, when I see it in the women. And to your point, I think it's actually making things harder for us because we're looking past each other instead of looking at each other. And there's no humility in our interactions. Would you guys agree with that or disagree? Heavily agree. The chats are saying. Okay. Can I add to that? <laughs> sure. 
uh, I, I do think that on, on that note, I do think a lot of the confidence and bravado in our culture is false. But I also mm-hmm. think in general, like when people who aren't truly confident also cannot recognize true confidence and they see it Ooh. as Ooh. So, so like if you, I mean, and I, I consider myself to be a confident person. Uh, I, I don't think I'm super boastful or, you know, braggadocious. I can be at times, but jokingly, but the stuff I'm, I'm really confident in, you know, if I am, I just am. And sometimes I'll talk, and it's not necessarily among Nigerian people. It's more among Americans, and they'll be like, man, you're so arrogant. I'm like, no, I'm not. I know what I can do, and I know what I can't do. And if I know I can do this and what I can do, I'm going to talk about like I can do it. But if I can't do it, you know, I won't pretend like I can. But, mm-hmm. you know, that's that's almost a separate thing. I mean, that is a separate thing, but it's somewhat related. But also on that note, what you just said about how people like are like, it stops us from looking at each other and seeing past each other. I, I do want to kind of loop that back into, you know, what Marlene was saying earlier about how the pressure is like a turnoff because it's not a pressure to, it's not a pressure like, oh man, this girl is too much pressure. It's like a pressure like, yo, you're from my community. You are someone who I value on a level of like just genuine respect and everything like that. And I, if I mess up this relationship, in a you know bad way then i'm not just messing up this relationship between you and us i'm potentially messing up like some of the ties in our community and that pressure is i think something that's worth you know worth noting and and worth being aware of and and maybe as a community as a generation we need to find ways to work around that but it's there and it's i think it's valid so that's all i wanted to say let me let me let me throw this back to marlene because i think she brought up an interesting point um you, you, you kind of alluded to intrinsic value and, you know, understanding your value and not settling for less. What, um, what role, or, or let me put it like this, how heavily do you grade other people's assessment of you? Would you say you more heavily grade your assessment of yourself, other people's assessment of you, or is it a balance or is it an imbalanced um, paradigm? Um, honestly, it's my own assessment. I think when I was younger, in my early 20s, I definitely looked at, you know, my report card from others. But um, now in my 30s, it's definitely my self-assessment. I'm bouncing my character, how I behave based on what God says, um, what Jesus says about my life. Um, what does that look like? What does my walk look like versus what other people perceive or think they know of me? Okay. Okay. Um, let me, I think author, you had your hand up. Thoughts? Probably one of the most important parts of conversations to have. I mean, as alpha men and women, you know, cause that's what we are. Whether you like the title that's been thrown around or not, like that's just, it's in our DNA. And I just know as someone who's lived amongst alphas my whole life, that it's a very unique, challenge to coexist among other alphas of, of different different types of different backgrounds and things like that and so like this this charge to communication is is so so serious and i'm not saying i'm the best at it like <laughs> like tara pointed out my poor use of, of of language earlier when i use sacrifice and she said compromise like i was like oh like perfect you know so it's this i don't i don't I feel like the best solution is to just learn how to be better communicators with one another. Because if if we look at the same energy, right? They like say, how do they say, energy cannot be created or destroyed; it just changes mm-hmm. form. Same energy that we might think is of what if that's like the most immense amount of love or affection, you know? And it's like that's an overwhelming. I think one of the gentlemen said earlier is like when we when we let's say shy away from a woman who has this like strong energy or whatever. It's not as if like we think less of ourselves or we're not capable of like stepping to the plate, but there's actually at least, and I like the way you said it, but it, like the way I you know see that is I respect you more than other people. And because of that, I don't want, like, I'm not going to come at you any type of way, you know, and I want to, I want, you know, I would like for this to coexist, but if this, if I'm not on your frequency right now, you don't have the patience for it, then I get it. Like, God bless you. But um, 
yeah, it's just this, uh, it's just a constant charge to be a better communicator. It's something I'm, I'm mm. something face daily, you know, and I just hope that whoever right. I appear with or whatever is something that, that she would understand it. Okay. Arthur don't have, he's not as great as communicating in this area as possible. I'm going to be patient with him as, as you know, I can be with her. Cause it's not, it's not one-sided. It's not like one person's a prize. The other person's not. It's like, we're both prizes to one another, you know? And it's just like, we're both equally great. We're both equally fallible, you know? And so mm. that's something like my hope would be to work with somebody who, like I talked about, you know, just emotional maturity. To yeah. That's something that it requires. Yeah. Like, I definitely think that's that's a really good point. And and it brings up, you know, the concept that, you know, we talk about a lot on social media. Who is the prize? What is the prize? Um, now, Kalichi, I'm going to I'm going to throw this to you. Um, first of all, I want you to. OK, go, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go on. No, I was, I was I, waiting for a question, but go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I want you to first of all make your point, and then I want you to answer the question: How do you conceptualize the the prize, the prize paradigm? Like, who is the prize? Who's not the prize? Are we both prizes? How does that work? Okay, so I'll, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll I'll answer that. What I what I wanted to what I raised my hand for that's a very good uh, interesting question. What I raised my hand for was a question. If I take together the the issues of one standards, and then the issues of you know pressure, uh, the issue of what kind of response do you, what kind of uh, air do you give out in your response? You know, do you come up as arrogant or whatever? So my question would be, when it comes to standards, how do we know that our standards are, when it comes to a woman that I'm going to be with or a man I'm going to be with for the rest of my life, how do we know that my standards are not, are realistic and not unrealistic? You know, and, you know, so that because the, it, we're human beings, we're, 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 we're human beings, we're, we're going to have choice. That's mm-hmm. that's 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 OK. Well, how do we know that it's it's not it's not too unrealistic or, 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 or too low? That's one. Then in the issue of uh, issue of pressure and standard and coming up as arrogant, how do we. Refuse gracefully or is it hard for us to refuse gracefully? You know, like everyone does not going to be your choice. But mm-hmm. can I refuse gracefully as opposed to eyeing somebody, bashing somebody or, you know, that's, I'll put it as a question, you know, those two, two questions. Then to answer your own question about prize, yeah. I'll just state outrightly, I don't subscribe to any one person being the prize because it's a partnership. I'm not doing the woman a favor by marrying her i wanted a wife she's not doing me a favor by marrying me she wanted a husband so i'm not going to subscribe to all you i know i know there's this thing i'm I'm kind of i'm probably going to ruffle some feathers or whatever there's this thing about okay ladies you are the prize yes you are the prize in the sense of if you look at the traditional thing whereby the man goes out seeking so yes he's finding a prize but understand that you as well are seeking you want to be found so Ultimately, you are mm. seeking. So it's, it's, a, it's a partnership. You know, I wouldn't say uh, happy wife, happy life, but happy spouse, happy house. You know, it's like we are both the prize. I'm giving you something. You're giving me something. That doesn't take away the fact that, yes, the man should be responsible, be the head of the home and so on. Yes, but um, everybody's the prize. We're, we're both the prize. So let me learn about you and you learn about me. And then it's, it's a, you know, I did, I did physics way back. You know, there's this, there's this thing called a couple in physics. So it's two forces. They are equal. They're opposite. You know, like the, the kind of force you need to turn a circular knob. So one force is going left. The other force is going right. That way you can turn the knob and open the door. So I think both are, are the prize. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, I want to throw this question to the ladies. Um, now that we've talked about our grievances with Igbo women, what are you guys' grievances with Igbo men, Igbo angels? Tara, I'm going to start with you. What does that mean? I'm teaching talk back. So I'm tired of talking. No problem. So there's no problem. Later, no, later. no worry. We will carry on. 
<laughs> um, okay. Uh, what was the question again? What are the grievances? What are the challenges that you've had with Ebo men or trying to date or, you know, pursue Ebo men? I would say one, maybe not being able to prioritize between their career or, you know, what they're doing for a living and, you know, putting in the time and the energy toward building something more that would lead to marriage. And two, I would also say in align with that, maybe thinking that they're ready for that next step, but not actually being ready once they meet that woman that is, you know, serious, has the good qualities, maybe has what they're looking for. Maybe they like when they meet that woman, they're like, oh, maybe I'm not as prepared or ready as I thought I was. Maybe just mm. the idea of it, I thought I was ready. But then when, you know, reality hits and you actually like meet that woman that you're looking for or checks off all those qualities, you're just like, oh, wow. Like it hits you and it's like, oh, this is maybe there's a few things I need to work on before I'm ready to take that next step kind of deal. Do you feel like, um, maybe just maybe what the fellas are saying about the pressure do you think that maybe plays into um their unwillingness to allocate more time to spend with you i would say the pressure just in general on men um they're expected to do the leading um to pursue um to think of like date options or even to even just make the conversation start it initiate it to, to perform perform yeah. i mean it is a lot um especially if the lady is being neutral or not really giving you know a response back yet because they're trying to fill you out or they're wanting you to do more of the you know the work so i think that that can be kind of daunting mm -hmm. so what how would you let me backtrack. So I've heard that a lot, right? Like, um, even now there's a conversation about coffee dates. Some women think coffee dates are lazy. Men think coffee dates are fiscally responsible. Um, I've been encouraging men to deprioritize our first instinct because we, you know, we lead with our sexual desire for a woman and sometimes it clouds our judgment and we end up spending more than she's actually worth to us. Um, so basically I say all that to say like, how do you think the ways that our women in particular are presenting themselves, whether you talk about Shakara, to our men is helping facilitate the relationship getting to the next level or disincentivize the relationship getting to the next level? So in therapy, we learn about, um, well, we teach about communication being number one. Um, mm -hmm. If you are not communicating your intentions, you're not communicating, you know, honestly, like how you're feeling about certain things, then it doesn't allow the other person the chance to kind of, you know, reciprocate, support, mm -hmm. maybe give you um, instead of like doing, throwing hints or, you know, doing that back and forth game thing where you're, the guy has to try and guess and the girl can't like express too much of interest or whatever. I think just being, you know, honest and just communicating clearly, like your intentions and you both being on the same page by that communication, um, would help a lot with the cloudiness with the gray area, maybe even take off the pressure off of both of y'all. You're both able to just kind of let your hair down a little bit and really just get to know each other, um, your likes, the personalities, just being able to kind of just bounce off of that. And being honest with, you know, for the guy, like saying, you know, in order to kind of like figure out the date thing, right? Mm. Kind of just being like, you know, if I were to take you on a date, what would be the top three ideal places 
to go or things to do that you would be open to. And it can range from, you know, just a simple movie to a picnic to, you know, whatever, like, and in that response, you know, usually the female be like, oh, well, this place or doing this or that. And you can kind of get a feel off of that, right? And mm-hmm. you could also, as a male, communicate, you know, I, I want to try something different. You know, in the past, I've always just did, you know, simple movie and dinner, but I kind of just want to get a feel of like who you are and what you like. So, you know, taking a woman to the movie for a first date, yes, nah. You don't allow that chance to talk and to really feel them out and get to know hmm. each other. You want to kind of do Coffee something dates. Could, you know, be able to hear each other, be able to mm-hmm. face each other, maybe be able to do an activity together um, to see if like you guys can work together as a team and maybe like think things through, strategize or compete a little bit, you know, friendly competition or, you know, just something where you can interact and talk, you know? All right. So ladies, um, any of you want to jump in there and talk about some of your grievances with people, men? Marlene, I see you. She wants to speak after Marlene. Okay. Who? Chidera wanted to speak after Marlene. Go ahead. Gotcha. Yeah. I won't say grievances, but I definitely agree with, you know, if they're very career focused for them to be able to prioritize um, time to give to our relationship. Um, That is kind of like my grievances, but I think the biggest thing is essentially I can find that do men actually like, not I won't say do men, but if you're pursuing someone, are you really interested? Like you were saying, they let their sexual desires drive them. Oftentimes Mm. I have a, you know, I have either male friends or even guys that have pursued me are so quick to like, oh, let's go do this. Let's go hang out. And I understand like the momentum and trying to get to know me, but those conversations are crucial. If you want to say, oh, you know, she used me just to go to Ruth Chris. I asked like, well, how many conversations did y'all have? What did y'all talk about? And it was probably just text message, one or two conversations. It wasn't really engaging. You didn't really learn about her, but you're already like, let me take her out to somewhere. And you're asking her versus like you, that's a good, like give me the top three options or even just saying, hey, would you like to go on a, I agree with the coffee date. I don't even want you. If I just met you and I'm not really, first of all, if I'm not really interested, I'm not going anywhere. And if I just met you, I want something very light and easy. I don't want you to spend a whole bunch of money because I don't want you to misconstrue my interest when I'm just trying to fill you out. Um, But, you know, but I didn't really learn that until like my late twenties that I was like, okay, when you oblige to these expensive dates or gifts or anything that's kind of out the realm of this first stage of getting to know someone, you're signing up for this. Um, so then like when I came into like, okay, I'm purposely dating for marriage. It's like, I'm feeling you out. Like mm-mm, we'll have plenty of conversations before we're even going anywhere and being seen together. And if we are, it's something like, so we both are on the same page if we really have interest versus you thinking I should either give you something or I should oblige your interest because you spent a substantial amount of money. Um, But a lot of times I'm trying to hear like, what's that relationship with God? Because it's like, I think a lot of times we put so much emphasis in that person providing something from us, either we're spirit depleted or we physically want something, but essentially like people are disappointing. So like, if your relationship is based on biblical principles, I know you're more sound than just like, oh, you know, I don't like you because you had a bad day and you wasn't really as nice to me. And, you know, we had a bad communication. So like you're blocked versus like seeing good character in someone versus just like they've actually had like a few day, a few good days or you've met the best part of them. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, Chidera. Um, okay. So I do appreciate like a good man, one of the things I can say I've dealt with with Igbo boys is either they're giving too much or not enough. And I don't know if we talk about this enough, but a lot of Igbo boys, if they don't give enough, they they love bomb. They almost love bomb to a point where it's like, okay, like give me some space to just, you know, take this all in. Or it's like, like I said previously, like they're emotionally unavailable. Or I think a lot of Igbo boys too, definitely the ones who are not ready for marriage yet, but would like to date and just, you know, start exploring. Maybe they're just finally open, you know? Um, 
I feel like they put a lot of Igbo girls to the side. Like they 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 put us mm. to the side because they think that they'll just come back to us when it's time to marry. But for now, they want to have fun and go talk to every other babe, the foreign girls, whatever. And <laughs> and yeah, I peep that because um, I don't appreciate that really. But then again, I I guess I see what they're doing because remember, it's a marriage thing. We know we are gonna date within us our culture for most of the part. We're all gonna marry within our culture. But it's like you're passing a good girl to the side for the next person. We're right here. So that's another thing I've dealt with. And I don't like it. So, yeah. <laughs> what, what, do you, what do you think would be the answer to that? Because like uh, a gentleman mentioned earlier, it seems to be the case that most men in general, maybe evil men in particular, need that time to sow our royal oats, right? To, to flex a little bit, to, to see what we can do in the streets. So like, what's the balance between not hurting a woman that you ultimately might end up marrying and also not, uh, you know, prematurely jumping into something you're not ready for? Um, I just think like a good foundation, a good friendship in the beginning, you know, um, kind of like what was said before, like, yes, you can take us out, all that. But I, I really value like, communication I value a good friendship a good like base before we try to move forward like I want to get to know you I want to know you know your passions and I want you to be I want you to get to know me not like for what you see physically or you know just like me inside and I feel like um there's a good way to do that where it's not too much <laughs> where it's not like too much at in the beginning and it's not like okay I don't get a text back from him until 5 p.m and we last texted in the morning like, you know what I'm saying like there's a good balance. I just feel like y'all have to find balance. Like, <laughs> well, yeah, well, so one, one of the things I ask a lot um, of women that I talk to, there seems to be the sense of if I was a, a man, if I were a boy, I, I would do a better job, right? So yeah. if you were us, if you're an Evo man and you had all the swag, you were all the sixes and the whole nine, how would you... Um, how would you negotiate what you're talking about? How would you move? Hmm. Yeah, yeah. Ask her. Did you tell him to say his name? I didn't ask for any extra uh, ad libs in the background. But anyways, so <laughs> I personally feel like I would just move um, kind of smartly. I guess I'm very, I'm very observant. I can read people. So when I get to know somebody, I can kind of tell already like how it is, you know, you can kind of see if it's fake or if it's like, oh, okay, I'm a little uncomfortable. So I would, you know, actually, instead of just thinking that I'm just looking at how beautiful she is, I would like get to know her, see like generally like if she's open and just build. <laughs> wait, yeah, just no, 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 build. No, wait, 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 wait. I think, I think you're misunderstanding the question. The question is, if you were that guy. Mm-hmm. Let me let me put it like this. When do you think you would be ready to settle down? Um, and how would you prevent yourself from hurting or disappointing all the quote unquote good girls on your path to whether it's working and building your career or whether it's getting everything you need to get out of your system before you're ready to settle down? So first question, when do you think that type of guy would be or should be ready to settle down and how should he navigate his way through everything he needs to do to get to that point? Um, I think they should be ready to settle down when they feel like it's been like enough. I don't know, but that's like their version of enough. Give, me, like, give me a range. Give me like an age where you feel like, okay, my guy, calm down. You don't, you don't do like, give me a range. I'm getting up at that point. Cause I feel like early twenties, you're in college, you're a child, mid twenties, you're figuring out your life. Mm. By your late twenties, you kind of have your job secured. Um, you know, well, for the most part, I know it's not, you know, not everybody's fortunate, but you know, like for the most part, you've done everything you're supposed to do in terms of work, school, um, your own house, apartment, whatever. Um, by that point, you have nothing else to do but to go to your nine to five and go home. Or if you do your entrepreneur, or if you have your own business, whatever, focus on that. And like, there's actually no in between, but then like spending time with your friends, of course. So I feel like around that time, it's not by force, you have to go and find someone to marry. But at this point, every girl you should talk talk to you shouldn't be wasting your time you shouldn't be trying to just have fun and live life um you know like be young and have fun but um why are you smirking like that <laughs> no I, I, i'm curious no, are, are you there i, I want to speak second I'm it's gonna... in fire. okay <laughs> no i, I want to ask you like do you feel like 
the ladies are missing something because I hear you saying, okay, in the early twenties, you know, that's your time to play or whatever your mid twenties, you're trying to build your career. And then uh, late twenties, you're supposed to be trying to take things a little bit, a little bit more seriously. I think most guys, like the thing that jumped in my head immediately was like, I just got money. I just, I just got a little bit of money. I finally got confidence. I finally got my, uh, my, my body together. I finally understand women. Like, why would I leave the game in the first quarter? Like, I'm just starting to play. So, nah, please jump in there and explain to the women, like, what is the natural progression of Playboy to Pasta? Jesus, <laughs> Ossidy Pasta. Okay, so... Pasta. <laughs> So um, I always had these conversations and um, I, so for whatever reason, whether it's right or wrong, men, we mature differently than women. And, you know, if you look at from childhood to adult, um, a lot of girls, when they're young, they're told not to play whatever, to read books, dolls, whatever. Boys, we just exert all this energy, you know, and it continues to whenever. So like um, Chidera was saying, when we're young, college, I mean, you know, we probably change majors however many times, you know what I'm saying, for whatever reason. So uh, to your point, so I believe um, a good range for men is like mid-30s, so like 35-ish, because like Alan, you were saying, you know, if we're getting our first career or big board job at 27, 28, to immediately now be responsible for somebody else's daughter, another human being. Right. And me, myself, I haven't even had an opportunity to be responsible for myself. That is not the recipe for success. Now, our parents um, made it happen. However, as we all see, our mm. parents' error and our error are, are black and white. They're different. Um, the structure was different. They didn't have social media. They didn't have all of this uh, outwardly pressure that we may deal with. I mean, we, you know, we can say, oh, nothing affects me, but Instagram, all the quoi, somehow, Facebook, the quoi, somehow, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All of this stuff. Uh, so um, I, I really think that man needs some time to, um, you know, understand what it's like, money management you know, be by himself. So a good sweet spot is mid thirties. Um, so which kind of leads women to like, okay, well, I'm 25 and I'm ready. And so you're saying don't right. date men at 25. I personally think women should date older men. I'm not going to put a number, be like, oh, 15, 20 years. However, if you're 25 and you believe uh, a man that's in his thirties is more mature than you entertain that. And, and I do think the whole notion that uh, what, you know, you know, what we, what may we have in common or not in common is overplayed. Now, if you're 25 mm -hmm. talking about a 50 year old, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> if, if, if your yeah. father even approves that, <laughs> you yeah. know, keep quiet because that, that's not me. But um, I, I really think, yeah, so in short, to wrap it up, Mid thirties is a good range because by that time, we've we've tasted our money and probably other babes have tasted our money too. By the time <laughs> we hit mid thirties, we're like, okay, no more right. of this nonsense. I need the four hundred one k life insurance, uh, health insurance. Mm. Let me actually pay attention to like what's my BMI, my blood pressure, my weight. The mm. why today is all tomorrow is down. That's not good. Um, what is my sperm count? You know what I'm saying? Like different things. Like even me, I pay attention to all that stuff. I'm to the doctor, listen, my vitamin D, I think is low. Biko, what, what's up? Talk to me. Help me out. Let me know what's good because I have, I'm thinking about my future. Mm -hmm. That's facts. That's facts. And I think another thing too is like All right. So my next my next question. What role? Let me preface it by saying I, I think as a people, you can make the argument for 
um, Nigerians, I would make the argument more specifically as Igbos, we can be very, very superficial, right? And I've heard a lot of women complain that um, some of the beauty standards, colorism, texturism, featureism, are making things a bit more difficult for them, or even now like the BB, BBL epidemic are making things a bit more difficult for them to date because men are looking for this. And then men are saying the same thing, women are looking for this. What role do the beauty standards play in um, this dating pool that we find ourselves in? Someone who hasn't spoke yet should speak. Um, real quick, somebody said, what do you mean by superficial? So can you clarify that for them? Yeah, yeah. So superficial meaning that, you know, we prioritize optics, you know, um, what car is he driving? Um, how tall is he? Um, uh, what do his cheekbones look like? Is he fair? You know, some some of our parents are still very much colorist, right? So um, how does how do those things affect your experience as a man, your experience as a woman in the dating pool. Brandy, you wanna speak? Oh, you, would count, you would call on me. Okay, no so <laughs> typically I have my type, but I try not to focus so much on that. Um, I don't care really I don't really care how what a you know the car a man drives or how much money he has stability is important to me um how he treats people how he treats the waiter and waitress you know that's important to me you gotta look at those type of things well I do at least um you know so I just you know the vibe you know I, I don't really think about the materialistic things um I try not to at least I don't think that's really important but um I don't know I just try to focus on you know how this person treats other people his family how he his you know his interactions with other folks and how how I feel when I'm with him um in yeah. in, in what ways um do you think just so men can get some insight into the female uh experience or the female dilemma in what ways do you feel like you've been discriminated against um, in the dating market, especially in Atlanta? Well, personally, speaking for myself, I think men are intimidated by me. I don't know what it is. I don't mm. know if it's my lashes today. I don't know if it's my lip gloss or whatever it is, but I just feel like men are just, they're like, damn, she is, you know, she's probably not easy to talk to. She's probably stuck up. I can't get her. And I'm like, please just come over and talk to me. You know, let's have a conversation. It's that easy. I'm very approachable, I think. But <laughs> I, I'm glad you I made that caveat. I think. I Keep think I'm, I'm very sorry. approachable. You know, when people get to know me and they they have a conversation with me, they're like, damn, you're really not that. You're not, not that person that I thought you were. Um, so, you know, I don't know. I just, so, I, I encourage you, come speak to me, you know, and let's see how the conversation goes and we'll go from there. So there's a, there's a concept um, I read about recently. It's called the Joe Harry window. And basically um, the concept helps us better understand ourselves because it breaks it up into how we see ourselves and the things we know about ourselves and how other people see us and the things they know about us. And what's interesting is part of gaining a full and complete understanding of yourself is creating space for the things that other people know about you that you might not know about yourself. So for instance, you might not know you have something in your teeth. You might not know what's on the back of your head. You might not know that there's a, there's a bug on you. Um, and you might not know how you come off to other people. And I think that's really what, you know, um, impacts our experiences because I've, I've heard what you're saying um, come up a lot in, in my experience interviewing women. Men are intimidated. I, I think I'm approachable. And then when you ask the men who know her, they typically say she is not approachable. She's got the RBF. 
Um, we're not intimidated by her. She might just be um, unbearable. She might be one of those ball busters. She might be one of those people who insists on G checking a man at every step of the way. So have you taken the time out to actually ask people who you know now that may not have known you before and what was their experience with the version of you that they didn't know yet? Well, I started learning this um, sometime after high school. People thought I was, you know, this person, you know, this, you know, unapproachable, stuck up, this and that. But whenever they have conversations with me after many years later, they're like, you're not that person that I thought you were. Mm -hmm. And it kind of hurt my feelings in a sense, because I'm like, what is it that is, is it something I look like or I'm sounding like or what is it that, you know, people are, you know, they have that misconception of me. But I, I, I don't I don't I don't know. I don't know. I, I try to interact with people as much as possible. You know, I want people to get to know who I really am and mm -hmm. not the person that you think that I am. I, I like to think of myself as a good person and, you know, but I, I can't speak for everybody. I, I right. won't judge you unless I get to know you. When I get to know you, then I'll make decisions accordingly. But I don't know. I just have to, I would say encourage, I would encourage people to reach out to people that they don't, or they would like, well, how would I say that? That they're curious about, you know, don't just yeah. judge them. You don't know them yet speak to them, yeah. you know, and see where it goes. I, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, I would encourage you to empathize a little with the risk to the ego that men take when we embark on an approach, especially with black women, because what tends to be some men's experiences is, is not just being turned down, but being embarrassed. Right. So huh. um, I would, I would encourage you because I had to do this too. I would encourage you to, round up maybe some men that you know or some women that you know and ask them, how do I come off um, to people that I don't know from my face, from my, you know, <laughs> from resting, my, uh, the resting you know what I'm saying? Face. The rest and be face <laughs> to, to my like mannerisms. Cause the other thing too, like I've, I've had conversations with women where it's like, they were the sweetest person in the world, but their demeanor was just super stoic hmm. and they might not even have been aware of it. But it's not until we take the leap of saying, hey, guys, OK, tell me the truth. I'm not going to get mad and actually don't get mad. What is it that I look like to people who don't know me? Mm, OK, I, I probably can come off as, you know, having this dominance about me. Um, people mm, okay. say Making that about progress. my voice. Yeah, people say that about my voice. And maybe I have that, you know, with my demeanor. I will, mm. prob I'm probably, um, you know, I look like a matter of fact type of person to, I tend to be, but um, mm. I'm, I'm really a little mushy, you know, I have right. a mushy side of me. Right. And you know, it was funny, like, um, so I, I forgot who I was talking to, but he made the point that that is part of the reason why and we, we got to wrap soon. So please don't allow this to <laughs> go down a, a rabbit hole but he was saying that that's part of the reason why some men gravitate towards white women mm. because sometimes that white woman was the first woman who was nice to him just just nice right and then because of that because he's used to our women black women uh, even nigerian women more specifically being more um, standoffish um, some people might say intimidating that that was just such a breath of fresh air. So I've been encouraging our women to be a bit more mindful of how the energy that you give off to men. Um, I saw, was it LaVette? Did you have your hand up? Well, there was a line, um, it was Chisholm. And then okay. um, I think it was Arthur and then OJ. And then there was also LaVette. Yeah, there was like a line. Okay. Let, let's start with Lavette and then let's go to OJ next and, and then Arthur. Chisholm was first. Oh, Chisholm. I'm sorry. Chisholm. Right, yeah. yeah, I was the last in the line. Yeah. Chisholm. I don't know why I was saying Chisholm. Chisholm. No, it's okay. I, all I wanted to say was, you know, I, I've heard this comment a lot tonight. Women saying, you know, I don't care about money. And I, I don't, I don't want people to feel, especially women to feel like 
there's virtue in wanting and not wanting a man with money. Like it's okay to want a man with money because the most dangerous man in my experience is an insecure man. And in our capitalistic society, a lot of insecurity is rooted in not feeling like you have enough to provide, which you know translates to not having enough money. It's okay to want and desire a man with money. That's not anything to be ashamed of. And so that's that's all I wanted to say because I I would not tell my if I had a daughter, my daughter or my sisters or any woman I cared about to like, oh, just because you love a man, it's okay not to, for him not to have money. Like money isn't everything, but it is important, especially if you start talking about the things that, you know, traditionally men are expected as supposed to do, provide, you know, be fun, go out on dates, like all of that takes money. And, and yeah, so that's all I wanted to say. Absolutely. Appreciate you, brother. Levette, jump in there. Um, okay, so let's see. So I, I kind of wanted to touch on that part where you said, um, like to go and kind of ask around or ask your friends kind of like how you come off and things like that. And so when I was in college, I, I did that because I've been told before that I can give off a bit of an kind of like what, um, what Brandy was saying before about this like intimidating type of presence. And um, I was just kind of wondering what, where that was coming from. And people were saying that like, apparently I walk around with this like kind of an air of um, almost as if I have, as if I have my life together, which is (laughs) farther from the truth, honestly. yeah. Yeah. And so it's interesting to hear that though because it's just kind of like okay so what am I doing and stuff like is it they were just like no you just like walk around as if like you just you have it all together and stuff and so because of that like when a man come like when a man wants to ask you out or something like he feels like he needs to come correct like he needs to have it together and things like that and it's just interesting to hear that um and it's hard to kind of fix that at the same time because it's like okay so how do I because it's not like I mean, yes, I want a man to at least, you know, be working towards something, but it's not like he shouldn't have anything together or anything like that. But it's like, um, so thinking about that, even going in, like, just with the dating scene and things like that, um, it's hard to try and draw that balance or, like, seem more approachable. (laughs) Uh, And then at the same time, um, there's... I think when we were talking about pressure, especially about men feeling pressure from women, it's interesting. (laughs) I feel like on the other side, I feel like women also feel pressure from men. And so let me, like, don't persecute me, please. But like, um, I do feel like um, to, to women, sometimes like we feel as though like men are expecting a certain level of like, like a motherly type of feeling from women. And so it's like, as women, like maybe we need to give off this feeling of like, okay, we can care care and support um, like our men type of thing. And I, I don't know, I, because there was a time and I'm gonna give an example. Like, for example, I was in the gym once and a man came up to me and was just, we were talking for a bit. He was asking me where I was from and and things like that. He was also a Nigerian, um, not Igbo though. Um, And so he was Mm. asking all these questions about like, okay, so um, are you like, do you stay at home often or do you go out? And I'm just like, I mean, I was answering his questions, but I was feeling a little off about it. And then he was like, so do you want like, do you want a family in the future or like, do you it felt cook? like an interrogation. Yes. Mm. An interrogation where it was more like wondering, okay, do I, can I be a good mother versus like me as a person? And so it was, it was an interesting dynamic, interesting conversation there. Needless to say, that didn't go anywhere. But I mean. <laughs> what? That's crazy. <laughs> I guess that. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I, I do feel like even just, for me, like the dating scene is, it's interesting. It's, it's an interesting yeah. thing. 
navigate. But yeah, that, those were yeah. just comments on that. I mean, the, the biggest, the biggest, I guess, piece of advice that I can give women is like, just smile. That's it. Like a lot of our women don't freaking smile. It is correct because I, I, I wish I wish I was being biased, but I'm not even talking about it from the perspective of <laughs> of um, trying to date women, but just observing women and interviewing women like there's this stoicism that unfortunately, I think the hardships of this country or the hardships of a lot of women's backgrounds has given them and like they feel this sense of like I need to ah, I need to have my guard up at all times um OJ Ike man jump in there what are your thoughts hey guys um I guess I can't necessarily speak for all guys but I can just like speak for myself um I think attractiveness does play a role in a relationship because I mean at the end of the day like I mean I'm a guy at the end of the day or like for a woman to promote my ego a little, right? I want to at least like feel good where like when we're walking around, like like for instance, like if if I'm expected to, I don't know, like plan the date or like plan an entire day of events, you know? I mean, I would at least like to look good while we're hanging out, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know, my sounds sort of superficial. That's, that's just my two cents. Absolutely. Brandy, did you have something to say? Okay. okay. <laughs> well, I, no, I don't. Come on, you have something to say, I can tell. Jump in there, you're teasing us. What do you mean, like, pick, okay, piggybacking off of what are you saying? Okay, me, I'm one of those people where I like to dress down a lot, and I've always felt fine about what I look like. I didn't have to have lashes, brows, none of that stuff done. I put on a hat, some, you know, jeans or something and go to Linux mall and feel cool i'm walking around with the people with heels and all these names and stuff i'm like what is wrong with these people mm. so i mean i'm secure with myself enough to just be cool with just me i i, I dress for comfort now i do you know whenever i'm socializing i will put a little on but you know i don't have to do all of that all of the time i'm good so, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, to each his own. I mean, whatever you feel good doing, I think you should do that. It is what it is. It is, it is what it is. I tell you. Yes. So um, I just want to, I don't know what it is, but when I hear the whole, like, you know, I just felt honestly, this is a whole bunch of just judging a book by its cover. And that's the problem. Like, you should just honestly read the energy of the person and just approach them and then get to know them and based off what they're saying, then see if they're for you or if they're not for you. But this whole like, you know, women just need to smile or you just need to look pleasing or approaching. I just feel like that's just not, that's not right because that's just judging, judging a book by its cover. And I feel like that's not how you should approach anybody at all. And this is just my opinion. Um, and to Brandy about your comment about how you dress, honestly, like, one thing I've noticed is that, a, I don't want to say a real guy, but nine times out of 10, guys will approach you more when you're just looking how you regularly look on average instead of looking like all dolled up. That's something I've noticed and I've experienced. I get a lot, I get approached a lot more when I'm just going to the store, I'm in sweats. I'm, I feel like I look like a boy, but I don't know what they see, they enjoy. So I always say like, just <laughs> just wear what you want to wear just dress how you want to dress and a man will just approach you a man with true confidence will approach you and want to get to know you if they want to get to know you but I feel like somebody shouldn't have to walk around being looking a certain way or like trying to act a certain way just to get approached by people if you want to approach somebody approach somebody and get to know them if you want to get to know them and then from there make your judgment about if this person is for you or not that's just my piece on it though I think <laughs> I've heard that more more than you would realize. I think the challenge with that is two things. You know, guys know, for instance, and I'm going somewhere with, with this, I promise. Guys know, for instance, if, you know, if the girl has, you know, big yash, you know, get breast. If she get breast, you know, get yash. If she has a face, she might not have a good body. There are trade-offs in life. And I say that to say, the type of guy who is going to be a good boyfriend, 
a good husband, a good father, a good grandfather, is going to be somebody who's nice, a kind man. He will be put off by a woman who is who has a stoic demeanor. He's not going to shoot his shot for the sake of shooting his shot. So you you have to think about it from the perspective of the type of man that you want to attract. Now, some of the snipers that I know, they're not reading any energy. They're looking at it as like a, a, a game. They're looking at it as a competition. And it's like, oh, she thinks she hard or whatever the case may be. I'm going to bust through that, right? So I think the intuition that women are expecting us to have about her energy, I don't think we consider the opportunity cost of the man who's actually who actually has good intentions. And I'm, I'm here to tell y'all, ladies, the man who has good intentions, he's going to go about his business because he's going to be considerate of what if she's having a bad day or what's on her mind or whatever the case may be. But the man who doesn't have good intentions, who could give a fuck if you're on the phone, who could give a crap if your dad just died, he's the one who's going to shoot a shot. Because I've seen dudes do it. I've seen them shoot shots at the hospital, at the airport, the whole nine. So instead of expecting men to to read your mind or have this supernatural sense of discernment of your energy or your vibes, I would more so try to mitigate how you present to the world. And this goes for men as well. Like we can't be all mean and all gangster and expect to attract a good woman. We're going to probably attract the hood rat because that's what's attracted to that type of energy. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wish, I really wish women would stop saying that and consider what it's like to be on our side. Um, let me get one more person and then let us wrap. We've been talking for a while, y'all. There's um, the DMV. Anybody want to speak from there? DMV chapter. Shout out to the DMV chapter. I, I was a part of y'all for like two weeks until COVID hit. And then uh, I was relegated to the house. But go ahead, brother. Said two weeks. <laughs> two weeks, man. I think you're muted. No, he, he said uh, continue. Nothing to add at this point. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. Um, Brandy, you unmuted. I, I see you. What's up? Oh, what was I? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I mean, I didn't really have much to say. I just think that um, development is really important and, you know, for a man and a woman. I mean, we think that, you know, we think sometimes we don't have things that we could change or, you know, mm. get better at or whatever it is. Like you said, ask people what they see or think about you, you know, based on whatever. You know, so mm -hmm. that's something that I work on all of the time. You know, I, I listen to um, other people's perspectives, especially a man. I like to know what men want in a woman. I like to know what they, you know, whatever it is they're thinking. You know, women don't think like that all of the time. So I like to, you know, when a man is speaking, I want to listen to him. So um, I, it's just a, it's just a journey of personal development, just getting to a place where you're becoming a better you, I think that is really important. Absolutely, absolutely. Listen, I appreciate you guys for having me. I appreciate this conversation. Shout out to y'all. Let me do a hand clap real quick. So that's y'all. Make sure you check out my content on YouTube because it really relates to this conversation. Um, for the fellas, you get a lot of insight on like what women really think. Like I had one lady, she said, um, even though we ask men to be more emotional, um, in the times that a man has been emotional, it turned me off, right? And then I try my best to articulate what the male delegation is saying. So if you're curious about men, if you're curious about women, um, check out the content. And, and ultimately, I to what I've been trying to, there. what's that? So I, I seen a, I seen a lot of your podcasts. Hey, that's what's up, man. Appreciate you, brother. <laughs> appreciate you. Appreciate you. But yeah, so um, you know, we we need to first of all, we need to be honest with the fact that we want each other. I think that's a big disconnect. A lot of women won't admit that they actually need a man. A lot of men won't admit that they need a woman. And because you don't need something you you don't see enough value in it to try to think from its perspective or to try to consider the world from, from its vantage point and that's kind of what 
bridge I've been trying to, uh, a, a gap I've been trying to bridge with my content. So again, thank y'all for having me. Um, and we got to do this again. And, and in person this time, this virtual shit, I'm not used to it. I'm an in-person type of person. So uh, again, shout out to y'all. Um, Tara, ne, or na. Yeah, I put um, the link to your um, YouTube page in the chat. So be sure to subscribe, everybody. He got some really good content. And uh, can't wait for a part two, hopefully in person this time. I'm going to look forward to that. And it. thank you. Guys. Yep. Mm -hmm. And thank you guys so much for tuning in and for discussing and being a part of this event and we appreciate y'all before we wrap up um i think dmv oh, wants to pub an event um so i'll allow the president oh god presidento paul from dmv to shout out his chapter and whatever event they have for um, our members that may be interested all right good evening everyone thank you not and tamara great event even though i sneaked on in late um <laughs> great conversation <laughs> um yes uh as we all are aware may is mental health month so we are having a mental health series with talk nature um next week tuesday may 2nd so if you're willing to just plug on in learn some new coping skills and what have you in today's day and age just feel free to log on in on zoom we'll be posting the event if we haven't done that already on our ig page um, and if you're in the DMV next week, if you are, that's fine. We are having our bumper to bumper Hollywood party. Dress up as your old Nollywood character, like she Mike, Rita Dominic, and all of them. You just come down show face. But we're also having that next week Saturday as well. So if you're in the DMV area, but thank you for giving me the floor. Now back to you guys. Thank you. So once again, on behalf of the Atlanta chapter, I want to thank Alan. Uh, we need to talk podcast. I want to thank you for coming and doing this event uh, with us. Um, I am excited for um, the next time we do something together and hopefully it's in person. Uh, I think that's going to be very, very something. Very, very something. So, um, yeah, she's on. We're definitely going to try to get Alan to Atlanta. Uh, he does have a following here in ATL. So, oh, yeah. Um, so just real you know, it's funny. Somebody, somebody stopped me on the street the other day. It's still new to me. Like he was like, I watch your channel. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> but yeah, no, I'm definitely gonna pull up. Yeah, no, definitely. So just, uh, for those of you that are in town, um, this Saturday, we are having a community service event at the YMCA. So if you're interested, uh, they do have shifts. You will have to, uh, just go on our IG page, um, the link in our bio to sign up. And there's also a waiver that you will have to fill out as well. Cause you are dealing with children. So um, look forward to seeing you all. Um, traditionally, our Memorial Day picnic is always on Memorial Day. This year is on the 27th, which is a Saturday. So stay tuned for that. We'll, uh, we'll be posting the flyer soon. So look out for that. And um, so, yeah, we have some events coming up this year. Um, so look forward to seeing you all at our future event and tap in with us if you're not a member. Well, actually, everybody here is a member, so scratch that. But thank all of you for being here. I thank Alan for, uh, in, you know, leading this conversation. Dean View, shout out to you for showing up. Thank you. Um, so without further ado, you don't have to go home. You really don't. Get out of here, <laughs> man. Shit, I'm saying. Get in Ibu. Get out of Cardi. Daluo. Ishike. Bye bye. Okay, bye. No, bye. <laughs>